The recent election of Cardinal Giorgia Bergoglio to the position of Pope Francis I was an unprecedented event the world has never before witnessed. It is the first time in history that a member of the Jesuit order has been elected to the highest position of the Roman Catholic Church. Reactions worldwide varied from jubilation to matter-of-fact acceptance to disinterest. These very reactions reveal appalling ignorance of the true nature of the Jesuit order. Widely regarded as a benevolent missionary order, known for its educational institutions, the Jesuit order, as the Society of Jesus is commonly known, has long played an incredibly influential, albeit secretive, role in the destinies of nations, organizations, and individuals. Rulers, presidents, scholars, and even Catholics themselves who are aware of the evil perpetrated by this powerful, far-reaching order, have left on record grave warnings that all should heed. Following is a compilation of quotes from a variety of sources. Some admit that their own diabolical organizations were modeled on Jesuit principles. Others give warning. A number of those who sought to warn did so at the cost of their lives. World's Last Chance would encourage all to carefully study the following material. Proverbs 1.5 tells us a wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. Ignatius Loyola, 1491 to 1556, founder of the Society of Jesus and its first superior general. Nor will it contribute a little to our advantage if with caution and secrecy we foment and heighten the animosities that arise among princes and great men, even to such a degree that they may weaken each other. But if there appear any likelihood of reconciliation, then as soon as possible let us endeavor to be the mediators, lest others prevent us. Finally, let all with such artfulness gain the ascendant over princes, noblemen, and the magistrates of every place that they may be ready at our beck even to sacrifice their nearest relations and most intimate friends when we say it is for our interest and advantage. Let proper methods be used to get knowledge of the animosities that arise among great men that we may have a finger in reconciling their differences for by this means we shall gradually become acquainted with their friends and secret affairs and of necessity engage one of the parties in our interests. Immediately upon the death of any person of post, let them take timely care to get some friend of our society preferred in his room but this must be cloaked with such cunning and management as to avoid giving the least suspicion of our intending to usurp the prince's authority. Putting aside all private judgment, we should always be ready to accept this principle. I will believe that the white I see is black if the hierarchical church so defines it. Princes and persons of distinction everywhere must, by all means, be so managed that we may have their ear and that will easily secure their hearts, by which way of proceeding all persons will become our creatures and no one will dare to give the society the least 
disquiet or opposition. Finally, the society must endeavor to effect this at least, that having gotten the favor and authority of princes, those who do not love them at least fear them. Paolo Sarpi, 1552-1623, a Venetian patriot, scholar, scientist, and church reformer. They are a public plague and the plague of the world. From the Jesuit colleges there never is sent a pupil obedient to his father, devoted to his country, loyal to his prince. Every species of vice finds its patronage in them. There is no perjury, nor sacrilege, nor parricide, nor incest, nor rapine, nor fraud, nor treason, which cannot be masked as meritorious beneath the mantle of their dispensation. Muccio Viteleschi, 1562-1645, Sixth Superior General of the Society of Jesus. When sovereigns require a Jesuit's opinion on any subject, the Jesuit in question is to report the matter to his superior, who is to lay it before several Jesuits for discussion. The resolution formed after this consultation is supplied to the Jesuit, who has been consulted by the sovereign. Priest Antoine Arnaud, 1612 to 1694. Do you wish to excite troubles, to provoke revolution, to produce the total ruin of your country? Call in the Jesuits and build magnificent colleges for these hot-headed religionists. Suffer those audacious priests in their dictatorial and dogmatic tone to decide on affairs of state. Michelangelo Tamburini, 1648 to 1730, 14th Superior General of the Society of Jesus. See, sir, from this chamber I govern not only to Paris, but to China, not only to China, but to all the world, without anyone to know how I do it. Pope Clement XIV, 1705 to 1774. Following are Pope Clement XIV's words upon signing the bull of suppression and extinction of the Jesuits. A bull is the strongest legal document a pope can issue. The suppression is accomplished. I do not repent of it, having only resolved on it after examining and weighing everything, and because I thought it necessary for the church. If it were not done, I would do it now. But this suppression will be my death. Pope Clement XIV knew the Jesuits very well and expected to die at their hands. He was correct. He was poisoned. A peasant woman was persuaded by means of a disguise to procure entrance into the Vatican and offer to the Pope a fig in which poison was concealed. Clement XIV was exceedingly fond of this fruit and ate it without hesitation. The same day the first symptoms of severe illness were observed and to these rapidly succeeding violent inflammation of the bowels. He soon became convinced that he was poisoned and remarked, Alas, I knew they would poison me, but I did not expect to die in so slow and cruel a manner. His terrible sufferings continued for several months. When he died, the poor victim, said Comenen, of the execrable Jesuits to which the Bishop of Pistoia Scipio di Ricci, the nephew and heir of Jesuit General Ricci, fully agreed. 
Pope Pius VII, the Pope who restored the Society of Jesus. Soon after Pope Pius VII was released from Napoleon's prison in 1814, he quickly restored the Society of Jesus with the papal bull Solicitudo Omnium Ecclesiarum. If any should again attempt to abolish it, the Society of Jesus, he would incur the indignation of Almighty God and of the Holy Apostles Peter and Paul. John Adams, 1735-1826, second President of the United States of America. In 1816, John Adams wrote to Thomas Jefferson, third President of the United States, regarding the restoration of the Society of Jesus. My history of the Jesuits is not eloquently written, but it is supported by unquestionable authorities is very particular and very horrible. Their restoration is indeed a step toward darkness, cruelty, perfidy, despotism, death. I do not like the appearance of the Jesuits. If ever there were a body of men who merited eternal damnation on earth and in hell, it is this society of Loyola's. Shall we not have regular swarms of them here, in as many disguises as only a king of the gypsies can assume, dressed as painters, publishers, writers, and schoolmasters? If ever there was a body of men who merited eternal damnation on earth and in hell, it is this Society of Loyola's. We are compelled by our system to offer them asylum. Napoleon Bonaparte, 1769 to 1821, Emperor of the French. The Jesuits are a military organization, not a religious order. Their chief is a general of an army, not the mere father abbot of a monastery. And the aim of this organization is power. Power in its most despotic exercise. Absolute power, universal power, power to control the world by the volition of a single man. Jesuitism is the most absolute of despotisms and at the same time the greatest and most enormous of abuses. The general of the Jesuits insists on being master sovereign over the sovereign. Wherever the Jesuits are admitted, they will be masters, cost what it may. Their society is by nature dictatorial, and therefore it is the irreconcilable enemy of all constituted authority. Every act, every crime, however atrocious, is a meritorious work, if committed for the interest of the Society of the Jesuits or by the order of the General. Adam Weishaupt, 1748 to 1830, a Jesuit German philosopher and founder of the Order of the Illuminati. The degree of power to which the representatives of the Society of Jesus had been able to attain in Bavaria was all but absolute. Members of the order were the confessors and preceptors of the electors, hence they had a direct influence upon the policies of government. The censorship of religion had fallen into their eager hands to the extent that some of the parishes even were compelled to recognize their authority and power. To exterminate all Protestant influence and to render the Catholic establishment complete, they had taken possession of the instruments of public education. It was by Jesuits that the majority of the Bavarian colleges were founded and by them they were controlled. By them also the secondary schools of the country were conducted. The Marquis de Lafayette 1757 to 1834, a French statesman and general. It is my opinion that if the liberties of this country, the United States of America, are destroyed, it will be by the subtlety of the Roman Catholic Jesuit priests, for they are the most crafty, dangerous enemies to civil and religious liberty. They have instigated most of the wars of Europe, Friedrich von Hardenberg, 
1772 to 1801, German philosopher. Never before in the course of the world's history had such a society, that is, the Jesuit order, appeared. The old Roman Senate itself did not lay schemes for world domination with greater certainty of success. André Marie Jean Jacques Dupin, 1783 to 1865, a French statesman. The Jesuits are a naked sword whose hilt is at Rome, but its blade is everywhere, invisible until its stroke is felt. Samuel Morse, 1791 to 1872, American inventor of the telegraph. They are Jesuits. This society of men, after exerting their tyranny for upwards of 200 years, at length became so formidable to the world, threatening the entire subversion of all social order, that even the Pope, whose devoted subjects they are, and must be, by the vow of their society, was compelled to dissolve them. They had not been suppressed, however, for 50 years before the waning influence of popery and despotism required their useful labors to resist the light of democratic liberty and the Pope, Pius VII, simultaneously with the formation of the Holy Alliance, revived the order of the Jesuits in all their hourly. From their vow of unqualified submission to the sovereign pontiff, they have been appropriately called the Pope's bodyguard. And do Americans need to be told what Jesuits are? They are a secret society, a sort of Masonic order, with super-added features of revolting odiousness and a thousand times more dangerous. They are not merely priests or of one religious creed, they are merchants and lawyers and editors and men of any profession having no outward badge in this country by which to be recognized. They are about in all your society. They can assume any character, that of angels of light or ministers of darkness, to accomplish their one great end, the service upon which they are sent. Whatever that service may be, they are all educated men, prepared and sworn to start at any moment and in any direction, and for any service, commanded by the general of their order, bound to no family, community or country, by the ordinary ties which bind men, and sold for life to the cause of the Roman pontiff. And who are these agents? They are for the most part Jesuits an ecclesiastical order proverbial through the world for cunning, duplicity, and total want of moral principle, an order so skilled in all the arts of deception that even in Catholic countries, in Italy itself, it became intolerable and the people required its suppression. Orestes Augustus Brownson, 1803 to 1876, New England intellectual and activist, preacher, labor organizer, and noted Catholic convert and writer. Undoubtedly, it is the intention of the Pope to possess this country, America. In this intention, he is aided by the Jesuits and all the Catholic prelates and priests. If the Catholic Church becomes predominant here, Protestants will all be exterminated. Abraham Lincoln, 1809 to 1865, 16th President of the United States of America. This war, the American Civil War, 1860 to 1865, would never have been possible without the sinister influence of the Jesuits. We owe it to popery that we now see our land reddened with the blood of her noblest sons. Though there were great differences of opinion between the South and North on the question of slavery, neither Jeff Davis nor any one of the leading men of the Confederacy would have dared to attack the North had they not relied on the promise of the Jesuits 
that under the mask of democracy, the money and the arms of the Roman Catholics, even the arms of France, were at their disposal if they would attack us. The Protestants of both the North and South would surely unite to exterminate the priests and the Jesuits if they could learn how the priests and nuns and the monks which daily land on our shores under the pretext of preaching their religion are nothing else but the emissaries of the Pope of Napoleon III and the other despots of Europe to undermine our institutions, alienate the hearts of our people from our constitution and our laws, destroy our schools, and prepare a reign of anarchy here as they have done in Ireland, in Mexico, in Spain, and wherever they are, any people who want to be free. I am so glad to meet you again, he said. You see that your friends the Jesuits have not yet killed me but they would have surely done it when I passed through the most devoted city, Baltimore, had I not defeated their plans by passing incognito a few hours before they expected me. New projects of assassination are detected almost every day, accompanied with such savage circumstances that they bring to my memory the massacre of St. Bartholomew and the gunpowder plot. We feel at their investigation that they come from the same masters in the art of murder, the Jesuits. So many plots have already been made against my life that it is a real miracle that they have all failed when we consider that the great majority of them were in the hands of skillful Roman Catholic murderers evidently trained by the Jesuits. I know that Jesuits never forget nor forsake. But man must not care how and where he dies, provided he dies at the post of honor and duty. Charles Chinique, 1809-1899, Canadian ex-Catholic priest. From that the Catholic priests with the most admirable ability and success have gathered their Irish legions into the great cities of the United States and the American people must be very blind indeed if they do not see that if they do nothing to prevent it the day is very near when the Jesuits will rule their country from the magnificent White House at Washington to the humblest civil and military department of this vast republic. Brigadier General Thomas M. Harris, 1817 to 1906, physician and Union general during the Civil War. The organization of the Roman Catholic hierarchy is a complete military despotism of which the Pope is the ostensible head. The Black Pope is the head of the Order of the Jesuits and is called a general. He not only has command of his own order, but directs and controls the general policy of the Roman Catholic Church. He is the power behind the throne and is the real potential head of the hierarchy. There is no independence of thought or of action in its subordinate parts. Implicit and unquestioning obedience to the orders of superiors in authority is the sworn duty of the priesthood of every grade. It would seem that the Jesuits had had it in mind from the beginning of the war, the American Civil War of 1861 to 1865, to find an occasion for the taking off, that is the assassination, of Mr. Abraham Lincoln. The favorite policy of the Jesuits is that of assassination. Fyodor Dostoevsky, 1821 to 1881, famous Russian novelist. The Jesuits are simply the Roman army for the earthly sovereignty of the world in the future, with the pontiff of Rome for emperor. That's their ideal. Its simple lust of power, a filthy earthly gain of domination, something like a universal serfdom with them as masters. That's all they stand for. 
They don't even believe in God, perhaps. Margaret F. Cusick, 1829-1899, converted nun of Kenmare. The great idea of the Jesuit has always been a universal spiritual and temporal monarchy in which the Jesuit should reign supreme. England has always been the place desired for the base of operations necessary for this end. Hence the blood, the tears shed, and the schemes undertaken in this country by the Jesuit. He has by no means ended his efforts for the subjugation of the world to Rome through England. When the Jesuit is expelled from one place, he is not slow to find another. France may reject him, not without cause, but England opens her arms to him. Catholic Italy may deprive him of the glories of his once famous home in the Gesù. But America opens her doors to him. He is the wandering Jew of the Romish church. He is followed by the execrations of those by whom he was once beloved until they discovered his iniquities. Charles Hayden Spurgeon. 1834 to 1892, British, particular Baptist preacher known as the Prince of Preachers. Our ancient enemies have small belief in our common sense if they imagine that we shall ever be able to trust them after having so often beheld the depths of Jesuitical cunning and duplicity. The sooner we let certain archbishops and cardinals know that we are aware of their designs and will in nothing cooperate with them, the better for us and our country. Of course, we shall be howled at as bigots, but we can afford to smile at that cry when it comes from the church which invented the Inquisition. No peace with Rome is the motto of reason as well as of religion. Richard W. Thompson, 1809 to 1900, Secretary of the Navy, United States of America. The Jesuits are the deadly enemies of civil and religious liberty. The Jesuit general occupies the place of God and must be obeyed, howsoever the peace and welfare of the multitude may be imperiled or the nations be convulsed from center to circumference, the Society of Jesuits must obtain the mastery, even if general anarchy shall prevail, or all the world besides be covered with the fragments of a universal wreck. The sovereigns of the Holy Alliance had massed large armies and soon entered into a pledge to devote them to the suppression of all uprisings of the people in favor of free government. And he, Pius VII, desired to devote the Jesuits, supported by his pontifical power, to the accomplishment of that end. He knew how faithfully they would apply themselves to that work, and hence he counseled them in his decree of restoration to strictly observe the useful advices and salutary counsels whereby Loyola had made absolution the cornerstone of the society. Luigi de Sanctis, 19th century ex-official censor of the Inquisition. All these things caused the Father General of the Jesuits to be feared by the Pope and sovereigns. A sovereign who is not there, the Jesuits' friend, will sooner or later experience their vengeance. At what then do the Jesuits aim? According to them, they only seek the greater glory of God. But if you examine the facts, you will find that they aim at universal dominion alone. They have rendered themselves indispensable to the Pope, who without them could not exist because Catholicism is identified with them. 
they have rendered themselves indispensable to governors and hold revolutions in their hands. And in this way, either under one name or another, it is they who rule the world. He who thinks he knows the Jesuits by having read all the books that were written in the past century, the 18th century, to unmask them would be grossly deceived. The Jesuitism of that day was an open war against the gospel and society. The Jesuitism of the present is a slow but contagious and deadly disease which secretly insinuates itself. It is a poison taken under the name of medicine. G. B. Nicolini, Italian ex-Catholic, in 1854 published the finest Italian history of the Jesuits in existence. Take the Jesuit for what he ought or appears to be and you commit the greatest of blunders draw the character after what the Jesuit seems to be in London, you will not recognize your portrait in the Jesuit of Rome. The Jesuit is the man of circumstances. Despotic in Spain, constitutional in England, Republican in Paraguay, bigot in Rome, idolater in India. He shall assume and act out in his own person with admirable flexibility, all those different features by which men are usually to be distinguished from each other. He will accompany the gay women of the world to the theater and will share in the excesses of the debauchee. With solemn countenance, he will take his place by the side of the religious man at church and he will revel in the tavern with the glutton and the sot. He dresses in all garbs, speaks all languages, knows all customs, is present everywhere, though nowhere recognized, and all this it should seem, O oh monstrous blasphemy, for the greater glory of God, ad majorum dei gloriam. The members of the society are divided into four classes, the professed, coadjutors, scholars, and novices. There is also a secret fifth class known only to the general and a few faithful Jesuits, which perhaps more than any other contributes to the dreaded and mysterious power of the order. It is composed of laymen of all ranks, from the minister to the humble shoe boy. These are affiliated to the society, but not bound by any vows. They are persons who will make themselves useful. They act as the spies of the order and serve, often unwittingly, as the tools and accomplices in dark and mysterious crimes. The Jesuit Father Francis Pellico candidly confesses that the many illustrious friends of the society remain occult and obliged to be silent. There is no record in the history of an association whose organization has stood for 300 years unchanged and unaltered by all the assaults of men and time, and which has exercised such an immense influence over the destinies of mankind. The ends justify the means is his favorite maxim, and as his only end, as we have shown, is the order at its bidding, the Jesuit is ready to commit any crime whatsoever. The immense wealth of the Jesuits has been bequeathed to them by wills made at the last hour. Francis Parkman, 1823 to 1893, American historian. The Jesuits then, as now, were the most forcible exponents of ultramontane principles. The Church to rule the world, the Pope to rule the Church, the Jesuits to rule the Pope. Such was and is the simple program of the Order of Jesus, 
and to which they have held fast except on a few rare occasions of misunderstanding with the Vice-Regent of Christ. Hector Macpherson, 1851-1924, prolific Scottish writer and journalist. So hurtful was the Jesuit order found to be that up to 1860 it was expelled no fewer than 70 times from countries which had suffered from its machinations. In spite of continental warnings, England under Queen Victoria 1837 to 1901, who opened up communication with the Vatican in 1877 and enabled the order to carry out its second Irish massacre 1845 to 1850, has become a Jesuit dumping ground. Those whom other countries have found from sad experience to be enemies, Britain allows to land on her shores and to carry on unmolested their work of iniquity. We are carrying toleration to excess, and unless there is a change of policy, this nation will one day pay a heavy penalty. For the Jeremy J. Crowley, 1861 to 1927, American ex-Catholic priest. All through the Middle Ages and the Renaissance period, the popes kept Italy in turmoil and bloodshed for their own family and territorial advantages. And they kept all Europe in turmoil for two centuries after the Reformation. In fact, just as long as they could in the wars of religion. Their whole policy is based on stirring up hatred and promoting conflicts from which they hope to draw worldly advantage. Popes and their Jesuitical agents have been and are the instigators of wars. And while the world is having real pain, Rome is having champagne. The Jesuit Superior General is at the head of this black and mute militia which thinks, wills, acts, obeys as the passive instrument of his designs. Their whole life must have but one aim, the advancement of the Jesuit order to which they are attached. How long shall the Roman Catholic hierarchy play the people for fools? Shall the government be of the people, for the people, and by the people, or by the Pope? Let's not let the Pope of Rome name our president for us. Lovers of your country, beware of Jesuitical intrigues, the political power of Romanism, and the honeyed words of politicians reaching after the presidency. Ellen G. White 1827 to 1915, prolific author and American Christian pioneer. Jesuitism inspired its followers with fanaticism. There was no crime too great for them to commit, no deception too base for them to practice, no disguise too difficult for them to assume. It was a fundamental principle of the order that the end justifies the means. By this code, lying, theft, perjury, assassination were not only pardonable but commendable when they serve the interests of the Church. Under various disguises, the Jesuits worked their way into offices of state, climbing up to be the counselors of kings and shaping the policy of nations. Edmund Ronain, 1832 to 1911, former Freemason who served as both secretary and master of Keystone Lodge. The religion of masonry is a system of absolute despotism and like that of Rome, demands a blind, unquestioning obedience to all its laws, rules, and edicts, whether right or wrong. What a singular commentary on the indifference, the subserviency, or the cowardice of society, 
that an institution professedly organized by such cunning knaves, the Jesuits, and for such base purposes, and which has been sustained by fraud, falsehood, and deception, from the commencement of its career to the present time, should be permitted today to dictate to, if not virtually to rule the nation, and to create such a dread in communities that even some of the ministers of Christian denominations, who detest its vile philosophy and who would like to see it swept from the face of the earth, are absolutely afraid to mention its name, either in the pulpit, the prayer meeting, or the Sabbath school, lest its secret vendetta vengeance might, in some concealed manner, be wreaked upon them. Adolf Hitler, 1889-1945, Austrian-born German politician and the leader of the Nazi party. I have learned most of all from the Jesuit order. So far there has been nothing more imposing on earth than the hierarchical organization of the Catholic Church. A good part of that organization I have transported direct to my own party. The Catholic Church must be held up as an example. I will tell you a secret. I am founding an order. In Himmler, I see R, Ignatius de Loyola. Walter Friedrich Schellenberg. 1910 to 1952, German SS Brigadier Führer, who rose through the ranks of the SS to become the head of foreign intelligence. The SS had been organized by Himmler according to the principles of the Jesuit order. The rules of service and spiritual exercises prescribed by Ignatius de Loyola constituted a model which Himmler strove carefully to copy. Absolute obedience was the supreme rule. Every order had to be executed without comment. Avro Manhattan, 1914 to 1990, a writer and philosopher. The Jesuits are one of the largest stockholders in the American Steel Company, Republic and National. They are also among the most important owners of the four greatest aircraft manufacturing companies in the U.S. Boeing, Lockheed, Douglas and Curtis Wright. No political event or circumstance can be evaluated without the knowledge of the Vatican's part in it. And no significant world situation exists in which the Vatican does not play an important explicit or implicit role. Alberto Rivera, 1935 to 1997, ex-Jesuit. The higher I went in the Jesuit order, the more corruption I saw of it in the institution. I was invited to attend a secret black mass by high-ranking Jesuits, including Superior General Pedro Arupe, in a monastery in the northern part of Spain. When I knelt to kiss the ring of a high official, I saw a symbol on that ring that made my blood run cold. It was a Masonic symbol, the compass and the square. A thing I hated and I had been told to fight against it. I found out the Jesuit general was also a Mason and a member of the Communist Party in Spain. Frederick Tupper Sousey III, 1936 to 2007, American composer, musician, author, and artist. The Roman Inquisition had been administered since 1542 by the Jesuits. Edmund Paris, 1894 to 1970, author of The Secret History of the Jesuits. 
The public is practically unaware of the overwhelming responsibility carried by the Vatican and its Jesuits in the starting of the two world wars, a situation which may be explained in part by the gigantic finances at the disposition of the Vatican and its Jesuits, giving them power in so many spheres, especially since the last conflict. The Jesuits are a secret society, a sort of Masonic order, with super-added features of revolting odiousness and a thousand times more dangerous. The Führer had come to power thanks to the votes of the Catholic Zentrum, central party overseen by Jesuit Ludwig Kass, only five years before 1933. But most of the objectives cynically revealed in Mein Kampf were already realized. This book was written by the Jesuit-controlled Father Bernhard Stempfler and signed by Hitler. For it was the Society of Jesus which perfected the famous pan-German program as laid out in this book, and the Führer endorsed it. Nino Lobello 1922 to 1997, American author and journalist, specialized in writing about the Vatican. The Pope's confessor, an ordinary priest, must be a Jesuit. He must visit the Vatican once a week at a fixed time, and he alone may absolve the Pope of his sins. Michael Bunker, American writer, historian, theologian. There is a conspiracy against Christendom, but who are Satan's agents in this conspiracy? The agents are the Jesuits. Even though the Jesuits exude vast influence and control in the areas of theology, education, recorded history and current media, I am still perplexed that virtually no literature exists exposing the Jesuits' influence on mainline Protestantism. In this work, the author uncovers forgotten history regarding the cooperative salvation theology of the Jesuits. From Cain to Charles G. Finney, this book proves that modern Protestantism has abandoned the doctrines of grace and embraced the satanic doctrines of cooperative salvation. Eric John Phelps, 1953, still living, author and protagonist in the truth-seeking movement in the United States. In the 20th century, the Jesuits have conducted their inquisition under the names of Nazism, Fascism, communism and now Islamic terrorism, with their inquisitors Adolf Hitler, Francisco Franco, Joseph Stalin and now Osama bin Laden. Today the Black Pope orders his Holy Office of the Inquisition, renamed in 1965 the Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, through his international intelligence community headed by Papal Knights including skull and bonesman George W. Bush. To the abhorrent Jesuit doctrine of regicide, the killing of kings, we must now direct our attention that we may understand an established policy calculated to obtain or maintain the mastery of all nations following well-planned assassinations. In the past, the Order's assassins were either Jesuits, like Jacques Le Mans, or killers easily connected to the influence of the company, men like John Wilkes Booth. Today, these professional terminators are cleverly distanced from their Masonic master, the Black Pope, and given deceptive titles by the Pope's internationally controlled press corps, jurists, and historians. Such titles as anarchists, nihilists, rogue agents within intelligence agencies, or just lone nut assassins. Sometimes these individuals in fact do the killing, 
consciously and unconsciously, as do the programmed Manchurian candidates, they sacrifice themselves, die in the act, or are punished for their crimes. Created by Loyola in 1534 and sanctioned by Paul III in 1540, in seeking to destroy the Protestant Reformation and restore the Dark Ages with the White Pope, exercising his temporal power as the universal monarch of the world, authored the 25 sessions of the Council of Trent, 1545 to 1563, and established themselves as the confessors and advisors of the monarchs of Europe, promoting absolute monarchical despotisms through which they ignited monstrous wars, characterized by pitiless massacres of Protestants and innocents, such as the Dutch Revolution, 1568 to 1648, the Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1648, the Puritan Revolution, 1644 to 1653, the Seven Years, French Indian War, 1754 to 1763. While oppressing and weakening the peoples of the nations and the Semitic Hebrew Jewish race with the Holy Office of the Inquisition, aided by the Knights of Malta and later Scottish Rite Freemasonry from 1540 to 1773. We as God's people in 14th Amendment America have received the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior according to his blessed gospel set forth in his infallible Holy Scriptures. The authorized King James Version of 1611 must repent of our personal and national sins, then we must forsake them. Some of those sins are 1. Permitting the army of the Black Pope, the company of the Society of Jesus, to exist, mightily prosper and absolutely control the government of the United States through its Council on Foreign Relations within our borders. Two believing the Jesuit-controlled American press, which has continually lied and deceived us throughout the 20th century. 3. Permitting the Jesuits' Federal Reserve Banking System and United Nations to exist within our borders, as these two bodies have successfully destroyed popular liberty, liberalism, and the national sovereignty of every nation in the world pursuant to the purposes of the Jesuits' Holy Alliance. 4. Waiving our Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights secured by the declaratory and restrictive clauses of the Bill of Rights at the insistence of the Baptists of Virginia, and so dearly paid for with torrents of blood by our Protestant forefathers, through filing our confessions every April 15th, paying the heavy and progressive communist income tax, thereby financing a multitude of sins. 5. Permitting the drafting, vaccinating and sending of our sons abroad to fight the Pope's foreign wars, such as the war in Vietnam and the recent wars in Serbia, Iraq and now Afghanistan, resulting in the further destruction of American liberals and foreign heretics so condemned by the Jesuits' Council of Trent. 6. Permitting the Jesuits, in control of the government of the American Empire, to use our military and financial might to enthrone dictators around the world whose first allegiance is to Rome, thereby restoring the temporal power of the Jesuits, infallible Pope, returning the world to the Dark Ages. 7. Consenting to the Jesuits' Supreme Court decisions in removing the Protestant Bible and prayer from the bulwark of American liberty so hated by the Jesuits, the public school system. 8. Consenting to the immigration of millions of Roman Catholics and pagan persons of color whose loyalty to the Pope or their own race, religion, and nationality is greater than their loyalty to our 
Protestant constitution and Republican form of government, thereby creating a multitude of agitations justifying more centralization of power in Washington, D.C., and through amalgamation, the Africanization of the American white Celtic Anglo-Saxon race, being historically the greatest enemy of the Jesuit order, especially its Bible-believing Protestants and Baptists, as intended by the company of Jesus pursuant to its Jesuit oath. Nine, consenting to the Jesuit Supreme Court's several decisions of forced integration, resulting in the destruction of both the white and black races through amalgamation, as the exchange of viruses, bacteria and parasites, unique to each race, creates powerful combinations in the offspring, producing a non-resistant, weak and sterile population within five generations. 10. Consenting to the Jesuit Supreme Court's decision of legalized abortion, resulting in the mass murder of unborn babies, polluting the land with innocent blood, ultimately collapsing the Ponzi scheme called the Social Security System, justifying mass murder of the elderly by the coming fascist dictator, provoking the Lord against us to consume us until there be no remnant nor escaping in the land by means of a massive military invasion composed of a coalition of nations cleansing the land with the blood of unrepentant and unforgiven American murderers. 11. Succumbing to race hatred as a result of Jesuit-controlled Masonic agitators, such as the White Knights of the Ku Klux Klan and the Black Nation of Islam, justifying the imposition of martial law when the inner city race wars begin. 12 sheepishly giving up our real wealth, gold and silver coins in exchange for indulgences, the Jesuits' worthless paper money called Federal Reserve Notes, and thereby becoming a nation of overworked, unprincipled, money-hungry thieves. 13. Consenting to the cattle brand of the Jesuits' social security number, as a means of identification to be used by their international intelligence community, begun by Hitler's SS at Dachau, it being the forerunner of... 14. Obeying the evil 1968 gun law of Nazi origin and thereby, upon purchasing new firearms, blindly registering our guns, our swords of just defense, enabling the coming Jesuit-controlled white fascist military dictator to ultimately take them from us, making our annihilation sure pursuant to the Council of Trent. 15. Committing a multitude of personal sins, both public and private, ensuring that our annihilation will be a righteous act in the eyes of both the risen Son of God and mortal man. Far from being the benevolent educational missionary society many view the Society of Jesus as being, the Jesuit order is responsible for some of the most heinous acts in recorded history. They have battled truth and righteousness, crushed religious liberty, influenced kings and sought to mold the course of history to carry out their own agenda. Now that the visible head of the Roman Catholic Church is himself a member of this order, the power of the Jesuit order is complete. Let all who love truth, all who love freedom, Take heed and beware of the danger now facing the world in the person of Pope Francis I. Error and wickedness will ever seek to use force against truth and righteousness. Now is the time to draw close to Yahuwah, setting aside the sin that doth so easily beset and surrender all to the Creator. 
he will accept all who come to him in faith. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. You have to let it all go. Doubt, 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 doubt. Disbelief, disbelief, disbelief. Free, free, you are not.